Thank you, Jeff, and uh, all the organizing committee for uh, inviting me to this very interesting uh, uh, symposium. And I had an experience of going to Italy, their International Center for Theoretical Physics. They also organize a microbiome meeting. Okay, <laughs> so now when I'm talking, uh, discussing this topic with uh, mathematicians. This is really, a, a, you know, a very uh, a, a amazing experience. So, um, oh, okay. Um, we know that uh, all the microbes, you know, the total microbial complement uh, living in and on us is called uh, human microbiome. And uh, particularly in our gut, we have a gut microbiome. The complexity and the density of gut microbiome is such that we can call it our microbial Amazon jungle. And uh, they, all the members potentially can grow in our gut and uh, produce some bioactive compound and which eventually may go into our bloodstream and uh, interact with our cells and uh, uh, impact our nutrition, immunity, and the physiology. So this is why uh, it's no longer true that the genome plus the environment will produce your phenome. It's actually genome plus your microbiome and environment produce your phenome <laughs> or your metaphenome. <laughs> and, uh, among the microbiome research, you know, it's uh, more than 50 kind of diseases have been looked at, and you always find, uh, you know, a different microbiome in the in the patients uh, compared with healthy people. But then the question is, uh, is it because I'm diseased, so I change my gut environment, I change the microbiome, or it is because I change the microbiome in a way that makes me diseased? So chicken or egg, which comes first? You know, the causality question is actually the fundamentally important question for the whole microbiome field. I would say not only for human microbiome, but for any microbiome research. So causality is the key. So we argue in this uh, perspective article that we still need to follow uh, Cocker's postulates uh, established more than 100 years ago for identifying causative agent for a particular disease. And uh, unfortunately, right now, there is a new coronavirus going on uh, you know, in China and uh, spreading to other places. So we need to identify the causative agent for uh, you know, any infectious disease. But there is a set of rules you follow uh, in order to uh, uh, you know, achieve the level of rigor needed to get the real pathogen identified. But we need to follow this uh, same set of rules but we may need to do some modification based on two differences in the microbiome research. One is it's unlikely that one single uh, member of the microbiome would do the function. So you, you, it's always, uh, almost always polymicrobial. And also regarding of disease progression or initiation, it looks like it's two-way relationship. It's not like uh, infectious disease, the pathogen is always bad. It's, uh, it's caused the disease. Uh, in the microbiome field, so it's both uh, uh, some bacteria can be beneficial, protective against the disease, others can be aggravating or inducing the disease. So taking all this into consideration, we can first do microbiome-wide association studies. You know, just like uh, Janet mentioned, you may need to generate terabytes of data, but that data actually for association studies. So you can uh, uh, identify all the members of the microbiome which are either positively or negatively associated with the disease. And then try to isolate those associated members either into pure culture or into a consortium with defined membership. And then try to colonize these bacteria, defined bacteria, into a germ-free model animal model, like uh, germ-free mice, germ-free piglets, or even germ-free non-human uh, primates. Some people are doing that now. So basically, after you colonize the gut with, uh, with those uh, uh, culture of uh, uh, associated members of uh, gut microbiota from uh, human in animal, and uh, try to give the environmental condition, uh, see if you can reproduce the disease. Uh, if you can reproduce the disease, now you have an autobiotic model of human disease. And then the last step is to establish the molecular chain of causation. 
and identify the effect molecule from the colonizing bacteria and the receptor from the host site and how that molecular crosstalk eventually lead to a series of molecular events and then the development of the disease endpoint. So these, these are the total, when you finish everything, then you may be able to say, okay, I identified a group of bacteria and which can produce this type of molecule and crosstalk with this pathway of host and contribute to the de development of this disease or this disease phenotype. And then these kind of uh, bacteria and their effect molecules could be used as biomarkers for diagnosis, for monitoring the disease, and also used as targets for manipulation, for prevention or treatment. So this is the level of rigor we must achieve if we would like to move the microbiome field forward, and it particularly eventually to translational you know, uh, science. And uh, so then the next I would like to uh, discuss a few the, the conceptual framework that we use to guide our microbiome research and trying to answer the causality question, identify the key members and their effect molecule, is we should view them as suggested by Simon Levin and, uh, and others, we should view the gut microbial ecosystem as a complex uh, adap adaptive system. So just, so just any uh, complex adaptive systems, they share similar design principles. They, they are all should be robust and resilient, and they, you need to rely on modular design, functional redundancy, global regulation, but uh, out all of all of this, the so-called emergent functions are the fundamental features. So basically the whole is bigger than the sum of the parts. Uh, adapt, co complex adaptive system is, is a system that perfect understanding of all the components uh, does not automatically lead to perfect understanding of the whole system. Because when you put the parts together, you have something new. You have something, some new functions emerge at the system level. And uh, so to understand this, we need to know that uh, you first you, you need to know all the individual parts. But then you need to know how different parts interact with each other from a high level structure, higher level pattern. So here, particularly in microbiome, we, pr we know that uh, bacterial populations are the building elements of the complex uh, system. And uh, when they interact with each other, they probably form a structure called guild. And different guilds and it co interact with each other form the community. So we need to understand how from lower level elements they interact with each other form a higher level structure. And uh, the it, populations uh, are the building blocks because each population is a group of bacteria derived from a single parent cell. That means they are genetically identical. All the cells in the same population are genetically identical from each other but they can be either different in one single nucleotide uh, uh, polymorphism or they share many uh, other differences in their genome. And uh, so each, uh, each string is actually one uh, recognized uh, uh, population. You, you can recognize a population from the nature either by uh, isolating them into pure culture and characterize them and then they become a string or you can just now sequence them. You can also identify populations. So when you identify different strains, you need to group, uh, cl classify them, but we need to keep in mind that by definition, strains in the same species is allowed to share up to 30% genomic difference, which is three times uh, more different than human and mice. So that means when you talk about bacterial functions at a species level, many times you would be wrong because the function you are talking about would not be shared by all the members in that species. Maybe only a few members of that species would have this function. So this complex makes the, the identification of key members of gut microbiota very complicated. So we need to focus on string level or population level. But then the, que the next question is in macro ecosystems, different members work together to form a coherent functional group called guild. So members in the same guild not necessarily share similar taxonomic background, but they work together to gain competitiveness over others. So they strive together and also they decline together. And uh, then the question is for gut bacteria, 
do they also form this kind of guild structure? And what is the driving principle for them to interact with each other and form a guild? And uh, then in macro ecosystems, not all guilds or members are equally important. For example, in a uh, Amazon jungle, in a closed forest, the tall tree species or the tall tree guild are the foundation species for the ecosystem. And they are there, and they need to be there above a certain abundance level to form a closed uh, uh, interlocking canopy so that the system becomes uh, stabilized and uh, structured and uh, stabilized. If you lose your foundation guild, you start to lose the whole system. And are there any bacteria members or, or guilds? They work together as the foundation uh, species or the foundation guild for the, for the whole uh, healthy gut ecosystem. So these are the questions that we would like to explore. And uh, for the experimental approach we use is uh, we figure that it's very difficult to do just a cross-sectional comparison between disease and healthy people and then try to understand uh, the, the correlation. Uh, because of the huge diversity among individuals of the gut microbiota. For example, any particular strain now we know is only shared by less than 5% of the total population. So it's not like a human genes, when the same gene shared by everybody, but we have just some uh, mutations uh, separate us. So basically, the best strategy to identify guild structure and the foundation species in the gut microbiota is to perturb the system, change the microbiome, change the environmental condition, and then see, for example, you, we can change the microbiome of diseased people and see if their health disease can be improved. If yes, and then we can collect the fecal urine blood sample or periodically over time to capture all the potential variations, both host phenotypes and also gut bacteria composition and function a long time, and then try to correlate them and uh, to do the correlation. Yes, please. Um, in the tree example on the previous slide, when the, the tall canopies are removed, like another species, I guess, becomes the foundational species, right? Like in, in major, like if there's a storm, right? Is, is yes. similar observed in terms of microbiome? Uh, I, we have some data to show that, okay. yes, yes. And, uh, and uh, so basically, uh, how can you efficiently change the, the gut microbiota structure? Or, or change the patient's gut microbiota from the old, uh, probably disease-relevant structure to a new, more, health, uh, uh, a more protective structure? And uh, the most efficient way is to change the energy input because any uh, complex adaptive system to maintain a certain structure, you need a constant energy input. And uh, we know that uh, carbohydrates are the most important uh, energy uh, input for, for the gut uh, ecosystem. And there are two primary uh, sources of co uh, carbohydrates. One is from our diet, the primary dietary fibers, and uh, they are complex carbohydrates that we cannot digest. So they escape our digestion or absorption, and then they become available as energy source to gut bacteria. And there's also another source of carbohydrates. They are primarily coming from our mucin secretion. And mucin are glycoproteins. So you have a sugar chain attached to the protein, and many bacteria can cleave that sugar chain and use that as energy source. And uh, so you have primarily either animal source of carbohydrates as energy source to the gut microbiota or dietary source from uh, plant polysaccharides. And uh, so that's why I would like to focus on dietary fibers in the rest of my talk. And uh, why? Uh, interestingly, from this uh, uh, Lancet uh, systematic review paper commissioned by WHO, uh, you, they collected uh, more than 135 million person years of data, epidemiological uh, data from 185 prospective studies and also 58 clinical trials with this many uh, adult participants. So the, the conclusion is actually very straightforward. If you see high dietary fiber intake versus low dietary fiber intake, you always see a 15 to 30 percent decrease in all cause and cardiovascular related mortality, and the decrease of incidence of coronary heart disease, stroke incidence and mortality, type 2 diabetes, colorectal cancer. Across very different uh, disease types, 
you see similar benefits and very constant. And how? You know, if all these diseases are independent from each other, how can one dietary component have uh, such profound and across the border beneficial uh, effects, both for prevention and also for treatment? And uh, <coughs> so this, uh, 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 we know that uh, I would focus on dietary fibers and metabolic disease. And we know metabolic disease, particularly obesity and related diseases such as type 2 diabetes have become a devastating epidemic worldwide. And in China, for example, we already have 100 million diabetic patients. And we have 500 million pre-diabetic adults. Imagine just this one single disease in the next 10, 20 years for an increasingly aging society, it will be an enormous burden for both family and, and the society. So we need to do something uh, uh, quick. So basically there are many theories about why over just uh, 30, 40 decade, uh, uh, years, uh, the uh, type 2 diabetes incidence can increase from less than half percent to more than 10% in China, for example. And uh, dietary change seems to be a driving force. But uh, why? Uh, so some theories are because you have too much fat or you have too much uh, simple sugars. Uh, but then our theory would be because we reduced the intake of dietary fibers. So you have something, something uh, good, too little of something good. So if you look at the, uh, some uh, uh, archaeological studies on the fossilized feces of ancient human 10, 20, 30 years ago, you realize that uh, those ancient, uh, ans our ancestors probably uh, had uh, 200 to 400 grams of dietary fiber on a daily basis. On average, the you know, people in this room, maybe only 15%, uh, 15 grams, <laughs> okay? Yes? Are you defining dietary fiber as uh, complex carbohydrates that are not digestible by but, uh, human gene products? Exactly. Okay. And, uh, but most of them, should be fermentable. If they are non-digestible but also non-fermentable, then they only have some physical effect on our gut motility. So they, they don't have as much uh, expected beneficial effect. Yes. So exactly. So non-digestible to human, but fermentable by gut bacteria or by some gut bacteria. Okay. So if you if you look at uh, Chinese traditional medicine, you also realize that. Uh, Chinese doctors, they always give you dietary advice when you go to see them. They give you a prescription of acupuncture, massage, herbal decoction, always come with a dietary advice, okay? Don't eat this, don't eat that. <laughs> and uh, eat this and eat that. And if you look at the, the, the dietary recommendations and also there's even a traditional Chinese medicinal food list officially published by Ministry of Health of China. And so, Plants in that list can be used both as food and also as medicine. And we found that they are rich in two kinds of things which potentially may change the gut microbiota. One is polysaccharides, okay, non-complex, non-digestible, but potentially fermentable carbohydrates. And the other are various phytochemicals which also can have an uh, impact on gut microbiota. And, uh, we also uh, collected a fecal sample from uh, 314 young Chinese uh, 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 from all over China, uh, seven ethnic groups, 20 different uh, geographical locations, and they are 18 to 35 years uh, older and uh, clinically healthy. So then, interestingly, after you, you sequence their microbiome, and we found that there is an ethnic and the geographical location dependent segregation of the gut microbiome based on the 6 RNA gene data. But for Han people, for the majority Chinese, they are from uh, several different uh, uh, locations, uh, more than 10 different locations, but they cluster together. So that means primarily it's the ethnicity <laughs> driving the, 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 the segregation. No matter how different uh, they are, uh, in the uh, uh, bacterial composition. If you look at, uh, we found that uh, nine genera uh, of short-chain fatty acid producing bacteria actually amount to almost half of the total sequence we generated. So that means in healthy young people's gut microbiota, 
short-term fatty acid producing carbohydrates, more fermenting bacteria seems to be predominant. So if you put all this together, and then we know because uh, when you give dietary fiber or non-digestible complex carbohydrates to human, and they can become uh, fermented by gut bacteria, and they produce uh, acetic acid, butyric acid, propionic acid, various short-term fatty acids, and there are hundreds and hundreds of papers published on the beneficial effects of these various uh, short-term fatty acids. Primarily, they bind to the GPCR4143 receptors of our gut uh, endocrine cells, so they can induce, uh, uh, they can provide energy to, to our gut cells, and they can reduce, they can produce a POIY, for example, to regulate our satiety, make us feel full longer, and also they can produce, uh, uh, induce production of uh, hormones like GLP-1, which can increase uh, insulin production. So they have a various uh, uh, essentially important uh, beneficial effects. And uh, also, if you look at the published data on dysbiosis of uh, diseased uh, microbiota in various patients, like type 2 diabetes and colon cancer, you see a common pattern start to emerge. So basically, you see a reduced abundance and also diversity of short-chain fatty acid-producing bacteria, particularly butyrate-producing bacteria uh, in those uh, diseased patients' gut microbiota. And also, lower production, if you look at the metabolites, of short-chain fatty acids. And uh, so basically, uh, we developed a Feed Me, Feed My Microbiome dietary intervention. So, so in addition to all the macronutrients, micronutrients the host need, we also included a very high amount of non-digestible polysaccharides and also phytochemicals uh, in, in the system. And uh, so that uh, we, we can uh, balance the nutritional needs of the host and also uh, hopefully a healthier gut microbiome. And uh, I myself was the first volunteer, so I lost about 45 pounds uh, over one and a half year and I remained stable since uh, almost 10 years ago. And uh, Janet, you saw when I was uh, over large. <laughs> okay, anyway, and uh, so I would like to go over uh, two uh, studies uh, happened in the past few years. One is the uh, dietary modulation of gut microbiota to alleviate a genetic form of obesity in children called Prader-Willi syndrome. So because of uh, uh, mutations happened in the uh, number 15 chromosome from the father's side, uh, they, those children they were born with uh, many, uh, you know, uh, 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 problems. But uh, one problem is uh, reduced uh, uh, muscle tone, and they couldn't e even uh, suck enough milk, and so they were small and malnourished before weaning. But after weaning, when they start to take solid food, they quickly develop a very severe form of hyperphagia, and they are they feel hunger, severe hunger all the time. No, any amount of food ca cannot uh, satisfy them. And they always look for food, fight for food, steal for food. And uh, so because of that, and they become overweighted and mobile obese in the early years, like five years old, 100 pounds heavy. So this is a very difficult form of obesity to deal with. However, we accidentally found out that one third of the mobile obese children enrolled in our hospitalized dietary intervention program conducted in Guangdong Women and the Children's Hospital happened to be PWS patients, but they responded to the intervention very well. And their food behavior also improved. And uh, for example, this particular boy was uh, 14 years old uh, and 140 kilograms, so about 300, 300 pounds heavy. And uh, uh, he was in the program for 285 days and reduced to 83.6 kilograms. And a continued intervention at home after 430 days and he was 73 kilograms. So he lost about uh, half of his initial body weight and recovered from metabolic syndrome. And uh, so we, we, we did a, a, a clinical study enrolling uh, 17 uh, PWS children and 21 simple obese children. They are all mobile obese, but they responded to the dietary intervention. 
and uh, uh, it lost a substantial amount of weight and also improved in almost all the metabolic health and also reduced the inflammation, uh, systemic inflammation. So then to show that, uh, because we know uh, diet can change the microbiota, it potentially improve the metabolic health, but of course diet can directly change the host. So you don't need a diet, uh, microbiota to explain the clinical benefits, right? In the traditional uh, uh, conceptual framework. But we transplanted the gut microbiota at the baseline and the three, three months after from the same individual to germ-free mice. And uh, all the red colored data collected from mice receiving the pre-intervention microbiota, green colored data collected from mice receiving the post-intervention microbiota from the same individual. So overall, uh, the pre-intervention microbiota induced inflammation first in the recipient mice and then uh, start to enlarge the adipocytes, you know, induce excessive fat accumulation and uh, other uh, problems in the, in, the, in the mice. But the post-invention microbiota from the same person didn't induce this kind of uh, uh, response in the recipient mice. And so this is the indication that uh, uh, at least partially the diet induced change, the, uh, the gut microbiota changed by the new diet may partially contribute to the improved metabolic health of the host. So then we did a metadynamic sequencing. We collected the fecal sample every month from the same individual. So now we collected, uh, uh, we have 110 samples which covers variations both across individuals and within the same individual over time as a response to the dietary change. And uh, each sample we sequenced on the HiSeq platform 80 milli reads on average, so which is, which is about 8 gigabytes, eight, eight giga uh, base pair uh, data. And then when you do the first round of assembly for gene recognition, out of all these uh, samples, we recognized uh, a little bit over two many non-redundant microbial genes. So now you have only uh, one sample didn't work out. So we have 109 uh, uh, fecal sample and we generated more than two million uh, variables. So this is a high dimensionality data. And also not every gene presents, uh, show up in every single sample. Actually, most of the genes only show up in a, a few samples. So a lot of the uh, metrics is just a zero. So it's a high sparsity and high dimensionality data set. How can you do identify any patterns if you don't reduce the dimensionality? So when you reduce the dimensionality, we, we follow two fundamental rules. First, genetically, genes coming, uh, encoding the same genome will behave exactly the same way because uh, uh, when we genetically reproduce, we, we just copy every gene. So the, gene the abundance of genes from the same genome should be exactly the same. If it's different, it's the, gene it's the experimental error. So based on this principle, we did the first round of co-abundant analysis among the individual genes. So we classify, we cluster individual genes into a little bit over 20,000 uh, co-abundant gene groups. Each CAG is potentially a genome. And then among these, 376 CAGs containing more than 700 genes and half of them are typical bacterial genes. So these are bacterial genomes. And even though we have only 376 bacterial genomes, they already amount more than 70% of the total sequence we generated. So gut microbiota contains many other organisms, but bacteria are still the uh, abundantly dominant and probably also functionally dominant members. And then, so these 376 bacterial genomes still have the sparse, spare, sparse problem because uh, Many of these uh, do not show up, uh, only show up in a few samples, not uh, in uh, many, uh, most of the other samples. So we decide to look at just the prevalent members. Uh, if they show up in more than 20% of the samples, and then we, we, we keep them. So now we reduce the dimensionality to 161 genomes. These are both product predominant and also prevalent. So now we have those uh, genomes and we, most of them can be assembled into high quality draft genome. And uh, now we, we, we do further reduction of dimensionality based on ecological principles. So basically if two bacteria, they work together 
uh, for some reason, they are part of a guild, they would show covalent behavior. So they would co-occur uh, uh, across most of the samples. So statistically, if, you can, if they show co-occurrence co pattern, they are potentially a guild. So based on this, we identified, we organized these 116 uh, genomes into 18 guilds. And uh, so these are the same colored uh, genomes are uh, potentially one guild. And if they are connected with red line, and they also co-occur with other guilds. But if they are connected with the blue line, they potentially co-exclude from uh, with other guilds. And interestingly, the new diet, the, hybrid, the high fiber diet, enriched guilds such as this one to a very high level. But uh, at the same time, many other guilds which are blue line connected show the reduction in their abundance. So because all the members in the same guild they change in the same direction. They increase or decrease together. So we actually lump all the members together to derive the guild level abundance. So now we reduce the dimensionality to 18. So yes. So are you saying that after the high fiber diet? This group increased. Yeah, yeah, yes. We assembled nine fecal bacterial genomes. Some are increased, some are decreased, some do not change. So that genus or that species is actually not uh, functionally homogeneous. Yeah. They will still have a different uh, guild level response. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so after we reduce the dimensionality to 18 guilds, now we do correlation with many disease phenotypes. Interestingly, uh, three guilds showed negative correlation with many disease phenotypes, and nine guilds showed a positive correlation with many disease phenotypes, and the sixth guild showed no correlation. So now we have mapped the behavior of uh, major members of uh, gut microbiota from this cohort of uh, patients into 18 guilds. And also, not only we understand that uh, who works with whom, or who fights with, who, who competes with whom at the ecological level among the major members of the gut bacteria, but now we also know potentially who are beneficial. Like the, the, these three guilds, they increase by the diet, they show negative correlation with the disease, they are potentially beneficial. These uh, red arrow the guilds, they are reduced by the diet, they are potentially detrimental. They are neg co co positive correlation with disease, disease changes. And the other guilds, even though they are predominant, they showed no change. They are not, they are not responding to the dietary change. So they probably uh, uh, at least neutral to metabolic disease. And uh, so it's very interesting that uh, probably we can dissect the guild level structure of the major members of the gut microbiota. And uh, importantly, we need to know that you don't, there's, uh, if you look at the members in each guild, uh, they can be from one phylum or they can be from four different phyla. So that means they don't respect their taxonomic position when they decide who to work with. Okay? They only decide if we work with you, we can competitively thrive, then we work together. So basically, they don't organize themselves based on taxonomy. This is a very important, uh, uh, even at uh, the species level. For example, this is another example uh, in the species of Eubacterium elegans, which is a major uh, butyrate producing species, we assembled five genomes. You look at the behavior of the five genomes, and they showed actually different uh, uh, patterns of change in relation to dietary intervention. But if you lump all the five together, this is what you get. But individually, actually, you, they are from three different uh, uh, guilds. Some are increased by the diet, some are decreased by the diet, some are not responding to the diet. So this is emphasize the importance of uh, string level dissection of the ecosystem. Do you know the average total identity? I'm sorry? The average You mean the genomic uh, sequence? Yeah. They, share, they share highly similar, uh, they, they may be only a few dozens of genes different at most. Yeah, uh, we have that number, but it's not uh, in my mind. It's, it's highly identical, yeah. And uh, 
So in another case is we isolated the five strings from the same species from the same patient's gut, and we have the uh, finished this uh, genome of all the five five genomes, and uh, there there are only a few genes different. Yeah. Okay. So basically, probably bacteria in nature they work as gills, not as taxa. So that's why we we need to. Uh, look at how they behave and work together to form a guild structure and each guild potentially have some function and we should assign function to guild. Um, I probably would need to skip this one. And so the, the second study I would like to share with you uh, is a type 2 diabetes also a dietary uh, intervention using this uh, high fiber diet. Uh, this, this is a more rigorously controlled study. So it's a randomized controlled study because we would like to answer the causality question more rigorously. Basically, we randomize the patients into two groups, the Eurocare group or the high fiber diet group. We controlled the macro calorie, ma macronutrients intake and also ca total calorie intake across the two groups. So the only difference between uh, high fiber group and the Eurocare group is the high fiber group had uh, uh, about 40 grams of very diverse dietary fibers. So we try to, because people say, okay, higher diversity is better for your health. So we figure that if we increase, uh, give the, not just the one single prebiotics, you know, inulin or fast or gas, we give a huge range of very diverse uh, dietary fibers, also a high amount. Maybe we, should, we can increase the diversity of short-chain fatty acid producing bacteria, so we can benefit the, the uh, uh, human uh, patient by, by increasing the diversity of the short-chain fatty acid producing bacteria. Okay, uh, clinically, the higher amount of diverse fibers significantly reduced uh, uh, HbA1c level uh, lower, much lower than the control and also uh, fasting glucose uh, response also uh, quick and uh, lost more weight in the treatment group and reduced uh, uh, you know, cholesterol. So there's uh, not just uh, the primary outcome, HB1C showed more clinical benefits uh, due to uh, high fiber intake, but also other clinical uh, parameters. And then we transplant, so basically because of this randomized controlled design, you can only attribute the actual clinical benefit to the actual intake of dietary fibers. And we know that dietary fibers potentially can serve as energy source to encourage the growth of some bacteria, so you would potentially change the microbiota. So again, we transplanted the microbiota from the uh, same person, uh, both pre and post intervention, and we see uh, pre-intervention microbiota from dietary petty patients you increase the glycemic response of the recipient mice. But uh, the post-intervention microbiota from the same person actually uh, improve the glucose homeostasis. So this is the indication that diet induced uh, the microbiota changed by the gut, uh, high fiber diet potentially causatively induce all the uh, benefits. And then we did the metadermic sequencing, the same approach, uh, 172 inter-individual and intra-individual samples. Eventually we got uh, nearly 500, five, 5 million non-redundant microbial genes and uh, we assembled them. Uh, eventually we identified 422 bacterial genomes out of this. Uh, uh, they are almost 70% of the total sequence we get. So based on these 422 genomes, if you look at the overall uh, genomic, uh, uh, overall uh, microbiome uh, structural changes, at the baseline, the two groups showed no difference, but one month after, they were both significantly different from baseline and also different from each other. But after one month, there's no further change. The two, the micro, the two microbiota became stabilized. There's no further change. So basically, when you change the diet to a high fiber diet, it takes about one month to stabilize a new microbiota. If you continue the diet, you continue the structure. We also now have the data uh, after one year, we finished the study, we didn't uh, provide the high fiber diet, when the disease come back, the old microbiota come back. So that data was not published yet. Uh, so basically, 
the only way for dietary fibers to affect, uh, to contribute to improved metabolic health is by way of producing some effect molecules, short-chain fatty acids potentially. So we analyzed the profile changes of the short-chain fatty acids, uh, six short-chain fatty acids, and four of them reduced after the intervention. So they cannot be contributing to improve the health. But two of them, the acetate showed no difference between the two groups, but it didn't reduce. It's different from for the four other reduced ones. And so this potentially contributes to the uh, clinical benefit shared between uh, control and, uh, and the treatment. But uh, if you look at the butyrate production, it's, it's remained stable in the control group, but it's significantly increased in the treatment group. So this uh, uh, metabolite can potentially attribute to, contribute to the uh, treatment specific benefit. We know that acetate and butyric acid can stimulate gut L cell to produce GLP-1, uh, and GLP-1 can actually stimulate uh, more insulin production. So we also see indeed increase of uh, PY, uh, uh, GLP-1 in the bloodstream of the treatment group and also increased uh, insulin production in the patients. That's one of the reasons why they had, they had improved uh, clinical uh, benefits. And interestingly, there's one piece of data probably would be ignored by uh, people in other fields, but cannot be ignored by microbial ecologists, <laughs> pH reduction, okay? Of course, when you produce a lot of short-chain fatty acids, you reduce the pH. When you change gut pH, you change one across the border environmental condition which can affect the growth of many, many uh, gut bacteria. So then we, we are interested in how the major members uh, respond to that environmental change. So basically, after we assembled, uh, after we identified 422 bacterial genomes, we selected 180 because they are shared by more than 20% of the samples. And among these 180, we did a CAG specific reassembly. We were able to produce 154 high quality draft genomes. And interestingly, among these 154, 141 genomes contained at least one of the key genes for short chain fatty acid production. So genetically, these 141 bacteria have the capacity to ferment some kind of dietary fiber and produce short chain fatty acids. But uh, only 15 increase their abundance uh, after we add dietary fibers. And uh, 47, instead of increase, actually declined, become lower in abundance than baseline. And uh, 79, the majority, showed no response. And uh, so this is the opposite uh, when we uh, design uh, to the thinking about our design of the study. Instead of uh, increasing diversity of short-chain fatty acid producing bacteria, this complex dietary fiber uh, approach actually reduced the, 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 the diversity. So this is surprising to us. And these 15 bacteria, all of them had the genetic capacity to produce acetic, uh, acetic acid. Five of them can also produce uh, uh, butyric acid. And if you look at the 47 bacteria which are negatively correlated with, the, uh, with these 15 bacteria, positive responders, they are negative responders. And they can produce, they have a gene, uh, genetic capacity to produce indo, hydrogen sulfide, and endotoxin. All these are either pro inflammatory uh, 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 ant antigens or metabolic compounds, which can, for example, reduce the production of GLP 1 by L cells. So they are inhibitory to the GLP 1 production. And they all reduced. And uh, if you look at the genome, because we have a high quality of the genome of all the uh, 141 bacteria. Among the 15 positive responders, we actually have, uh, uh, you, you have for, for example, among all the carbohydrate active enzymes, enzymes which can degrade uh, carbohydrates, uh, the positive responders, they have more genes in proportion for degrading plant polysaccharides, inulin, starch, arabinoxylin, and pectin, uh, arabinoxylin. 
but they have a much lower proportion of genes devoted for degrading animal carbohydrates, mucin carbohydrates. Well, on the opposite, the negative responders, they had much higher proportion of genes uh, for uh, <coughs> adapted to degrade uh, animal mucin carbohydrates. And also, they are tolerant to low pH, the positive responders, and the, low, uh, uh, the, the negative responders, they are sensitive to low pH. Yes, please. We measured. We measured the pH of the every single fecal sample a long time. Yeah. And also it's not just the pH. There are also other studies to show that if you reduce pH to the same level with uh, hydrogen chloride, you don't see the same level of inhibition. It's also the short-chain fatty acids, uh, you know, antimicrobial effects of the of butyrate particularly. And uh, so interestingly, uh, these 15 bacteria identified as an average uh, uh, positive responders across all the uh, cohorts. Uh, if we, uh, we develop an index uh, combining the total abundance and the diversity of these 15 bacteria, so we can develop, a, we can calculate the index in each patient across each time point. And of course, you see overall a uh, much higher increase of the index in the treatment group. But this index becomes stable after one month, would not uh, increase because the microbiota no longer change after one month. And also individually, there is a correlation between the, the, the index and also the uh, eventual HbOnC reduction that you can achieve. And uh, so basically, uh, so this is in summary, the Diverse dietary fibers seems to promote, selectively promote a group of uh, acetic and butyric acid producers, and they potentially work as a guild. Acidified the gut uh, produce antimicrobials and are taking over available niches, so to compete with other uh, potentially detrimental bacteria. So this is probably is uh, uh, the ecological basis why dietary fibers eventually can uh, help uh, type 2 diabetes patients. So we, iso we start to isolate individual members into pure culture, and they show the protective effects in animal models. And uh, so the hypothesis is that uh, these kind of bacteria, they work together as a guild, but uh, not just a common guild. They maybe work together as a foundation guild for structuring and uh, stabilizing a healthier gut ecosystem. And uh, this can be individually different from each individual. And now we have a technology which can identify foundation guild not as a statistical uh, pattern, but uh, as a, you know, individual members from each patient or each uh, healthy people, and also understand their nutritional needs. So basically, in summary, uh, <coughs> we need to try to uh, organize uh, our data into genes, and then into genomes, and then into guild, and then into communities. And uh, so that we take uh, the causality question in our mind, follow Crocker's postulates, but we also need to know bacterial functions are string specific. So we need to uh, try to go down to string level, uh, all clusters of strings so highly similar to each other. But then we also need to identify the patterns <coughs> emerge out of when different bacteria work together. And uh, this approach does not require uh, existing database it's uh, reference free. So we don't need to look at the reference until we identify the key bacteria. And then we, we, we compare with the database, so we know, okay, which ones are already studied by other people, which ones are novel. For example, here, some, some are well-known species, and some are almost cannot assign a proper phylum name, um, potentially. And uh, so this is a reference free approach. And, uh, Basically, uh, I would like to also finish with uh, uh, other comments uh, uh, leave for the audience. And uh, if you don't have high quality data, you, have, you, you cannot have high quality you know, finding. So garbage in, garbage out. Basically, uh, we ha we we've, we we're now working with uh, uh, HM uh, HMC, try to see if we can improve the data quality. Now we found that uh, many uh, sample collection kit, they can keep the bacteria but they can stop all of them from growing during room temperature, transportation, and, uh, and uh, transfer. 
So this is a problem because they are, your, your sample are not fixed, they are changing. And also for DNA extraction, we use the same DNA extraction protocol for all different uh, samples. And we found that many samples, if they contain a higher proportion of uh, hard to break uh, gram-positive cells, and those cells will be severely underestimated in your data, data set. So all these things need to be addressed before we can really produce uh, you know, good uh, uh, data for pattern recognition. So finally, the classical joke uh, of my talk. <laughs> so we, if we uh, using the microbiome data and other functional data, we probably can develop a, a trajectory uh, a long time, uh, a long, uh, you know. So a healthy person would have a, a trajectory like this, you know. Remain healthy up to 140 years old, 50 years old, and then die in the last week, right? <laughs> But many people actually, some people can born with genetic disease, die very early. But most of us actually uh, uh, start to decline in our health after mid-age. And if this is due to genetic reason, we really cannot do much. But if uh, part of the reason particularly is the changing of a gut microbiome, then we have hope. So we can change back and uh, remain healthy probably throughout the rest of your lifespan. So eat right, keep fit, live long, die quick. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you.